Big Brains is supported by the University of Chicago Graham School. Are you a lifelong learner with an insatiable curiosity? Join us at Graham and access more than 50 open enrollment courses every quarter in literature, history, religion, science, and more. We open the doors of UChicago to learners everywhere. Expand your mind and advance your leadership. Online and in-person offerings are available. Learn more at graham.uchicago.edu slash bigbrains. Hey, chat GPT. Hello, Paul. How can I assist you today? Tell me everything you know about Professor Rebecca Willett. As of my last update in September 2021, Rebecca Willett was a professor of statistics and computer science at the University of Chicago. At this point, many of you have probably had an experience just like this. Professor Willett's research has included significant contributions to the theory and methods of machine learning. Instead of simply going online when you need to research something, for instance, a guest coming on your podcast, you go to ChatGPT. She has also worked on applications of these techniques to a variety of fields, including healthcare, astronomy, and social science. ChatGPT isn't the first AI in our world. ChatGPT, the revolutionary new language model developed by OpenAI with the ability to generate human-like text and hold natural conversations. But it did prove that these machine learning systems are capable of things that many people thought were impossible. That impersonates what it's read on the internet. Type in a request and it can write legal documents, software, even school essays. People are predicting it will wipe out whole industries. Artificial intelligence tools like ChatGPT have really, they've seemingly changed the world overnight, and many are racing right now to find ways to harness what seems like incredible power. ChatGPT, are you going to change the world? As an AI language model, I don't have personal agency or the ability to directly change the world. It is ultimately up to humans to utilize technology and knowledge to shape the world for the better. One of the ways we shape the world is with what we focus on in this podcast, research. And AIs could give us the power to completely revolutionize the way that we do science. But as our chat GPT friend said, it's up to us to use them to make it better, even though it has the power to make it worse. I think there's an enormous amount of, of hope that it's really just going to fundamentally change the way we think of the scientific method. That, of course, is University of Chicago professor Rebecca Willett. Just as when, you know, computers became widely accessible, it changed the way that we approached science and what we could do with scientific data. I think AI is similarly going to have uh, just an enormous impact on this entire process. There isn't a single thing that the professors and researchers on our show do that couldn't or won't be changed by AI. The way that we formulate hypotheses, design experiments, collect data, and then analyze that data, and then kind of close the loop by using that to help us develop new hypotheses. Willett is the faculty director of AI at the Data Science Institute, where she is at the forefront of thinking through how AI will change science, both the opportunities and the dangers. And so the hope is that with these more complicated nonlinear models that are being used in AI right now, things like neural networks, that we can take large amounts of data and figure out patterns that as humans, we didn't recognize or even expect. There is no one better to help us think through how these systems will fundamentally change how research happens. And we've seen this sort of like step up in terms of the capability of these systems. And I think this has really just sparked the imagination of a lot of people, you know, with these kinds of capabilities. What could we do now that we hadn't even imagined trying to do a few years ago? Welcome to Big Brains, where we translate the biggest ideas and complex discoveries into digestible brain food. Big Brains, Little Bites from the University of Chicago Podcast Network. I'm your host, Paul Rand. On today's episode, how AI will change science and research. ChatGPT, if you are going to interview Rebecca Willett for a podcast about how AI will change science and research, what would you ask? 
That sounds like a fascinating podcast episode. Here are some potential questions you might consider. 1. What are some of the most exciting opportunities that AI offers for advancing scientific research? So there's a lot of work in trying to use AI to accelerate the development of pharmaceuticals and and drugs. I'm especially excited about this because, as we know, there are diseases that predominantly impact underserved communities that are often under-prioritized for this kind of research or under-resourced. And so if we can use AI to accelerate this process or reduce the cost of this discovery process, hopefully we'll see a real leap forward in the treatment of disease Hmm. worldwide. Another thing that I think we will see people doing is using AI to design new materials, especially materials that are more sustainable and perhaps more biodegradable or better for the environment. Okay. Using AI to design things like microbial communities that can help break down plastics or remove nitrates from water. It could be really useful for developing sustainable climate policies. So not only do we want to predict what the climate might look like under different scenarios, but we'd like to have a better sense of uncertainties associated with those predictions and to design better economic policies, better tax strategies, better incentive programs. If we only have forecasting systems that can run on supercomputers, then our our ability to do that is somewhat limited. But with AI systems, I think we'll be able to to do this much more effectively and, and quickly and reliably. And so these are just a a few of the things off the top of my head. And this is just in the the basic sciences. If we expand our scope to also think about health sciences or or healthcare, there's just a lot of potential there as well in terms of improving our ability to analyze lab tests or medical imaging data, our ability to understand a patient's entire case history or even, you know, better evaluate how they will respond to different kinds of treatments. These are just a few of the incredible ways AI could change science. But what do they look like in practice? There are some basic steps of the scientific process. Hypothesis generation, experiment design, data collection, that are going to be revolutionized by AI. But we'll start with Willett's specialty, data analysis. One kind of first pass thing that's going to happen is that people are going to start using AI to analyze data being collected within scientific context. Uh, So many of us have read, for instance, about the James Webb Space Telescope. Right, right. NASA's James Webb Space Telescope, the largest and most powerful of its kind, launched last Christmas and released its first image in July. The deepest, sharpest view we've ever seen of the universe. Since then, it has captured far away star nurseries, cosmic cliffs, and galactic clusters. Anyone can see that the images carry breathtaking beauty and astonishing scale, but what do they actually tell us about our cosmos? This instrument and many instruments like it are collecting just huge volumes of data that can't possibly be looked at by a human, not all of it. And so the hope is that by using these AI tools, we're going to see you know, patterns that might escape a human or be able to see phenomena or anomalies that kind of countermand our current understanding of the science and lead us to asking new questions that we hadn't thought about before or questioning, you know, where our existing models are starting to to break down. And so using AI to just analyze the raw data is the bare minimum of what we're going to be seeing a lot of in the future. This raw power to analyze massive sets of data could solve a problem that's plagued science forever. Many times, whatever was being studied led to a negative result. For example, we thought these two compounds, when mixed, would create a new malaria drug, but they didn't. And because it's not a positive result, it would get discarded. Yeah, I think this is a a common concern in the sciences. I think people refer to it as the the file drawer effect, right? You get a negative result, you put it in your filing cabinet and forget about it. Yes, yes. That's just sort of the nature of, of the field, right? If I have a positive result, then it'll generally get more attention. And publishers are most interested in publishing 
those kinds of results. But that doesn't mean the result is useless. We still learn something. As the famous saying goes, we're just discovering a thousand ways not to make a light bulb. And I think perhaps AI will, will change some of these trends. But I know that there are ongoing efforts with using things like large language models to analyze the scientific literature and to you know, cross-reference different papers that are being published in different journals by different groups around the world in order to kind of extract higher level themes or patterns. Fascinating. And I think that's a setting where, you know, these negative results could be enormously impactful and help with the development of those models. And so it's possible that this kind of file drawer effect that we've had in the sciences for, for decades, you know, might, might we might just change the way we think about it with the development of these AI tools for trying to extract information from the literature. Maybe we'll see an, an added value to that that was a little harder to harness uh, in the past. But there is a concern when it comes to using AI to analyze data. The founders of ChatGPT have already admitted they're not quite sure how their AI comes to any individual results. In the context of an experiment, what if an AI analyzes the data incorrectly? If half the time AI models make predictions that contradict established scientific knowledge, but turn out to be correct, how will we know when it's right or when it's wrong, especially if we don't understand how it works? You know, real science is about more than detecting patterns. It's about really understanding what the underlying mechanisms are. It's just much more than, than making raw predictions. Yes. And it's not clear to what extent AI tools are really reflecting understanding as opposed to having recognized um, different patterns. So let, let's just take chat GPT as an example, because I think a lot of people listening have maybe played around with it a little bit. And when you do it, it can almost feel like you're interacting with a human, right? It, it produces very realistic text. But under the hood, what it's doing is, uh, on a, the most basic level, very simple. It's saying, I'm going to build a model of a probability distribution that's going to say, what is the most likely next word that you're going to say, given the last 400 words that you say? Yep. And then when I want to generate some text, I just start drawing words from this probability distribution. And so, you know, of course, building this model is not trivial, but at the end of the day, all it's doing is it's generating somewhat random sequences of words from this distribution. That's a far cry from understanding what the language is telling us or actually being sentient, for instance. Right, right. And uh, I think it's the same with science, right? I think this could be an enormously useful tool, but that's a far cry from it really understanding science. And I think humans are just going to be an essential part of this process. If you're trying to use something like chat GPT for science and having it write a scientific paper for you, you're, you're going to be in trouble. It's definitely going to be making stuff up. Hmm. Like I said, it's drawing words at random from a very sophisticated probability distribution, but it doesn't actually know anything. And the more text you have it generate, the more likely it is that it's going to be inconsistent with itself. I have two feelings about this. On one hand, people already make mistakes in science, innocent mistakes. This is why we form a scientific community. This is why all science isn't done by a handful of Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> You're right. But we have you know, thousands of people all trying to examine each other's work, find where the potential holes might be, identify real you know, discoveries that change the way we think. And that community is going to play a critical role in analyzing you know, ideas coming out of an, an AI model, evaluating whether they make any sense at all, whether it's a fresh take that nobody thought of, or whether it's just complete BS. Ultimately, just that human in the loop is, is essential. People with rigorous scientific training who can evaluate these systems, having peer review, determine what's ready for publication versus what's, you know, relative, more or less made up. One of the other areas, at least as, as I've read about AI and the sciences, one of the ones that gets talked about is this idea of hypothesis generation. And I wonder if you can tell us what that is and why that might be particularly compelling. 
we're starting to also see people thinking about using AI for things like even deciding what data to collect in the first place or what experiments to run. So imagine, for instance, that I wanted to design um, a microbial community that could help improve somebody with a, a broken gut microbiome. And I want to, to help fix that. So we could just sort of randomly put a bunch of, of probiotics in their, in their system and hope for the best. But a lot of the current approaches can be pretty short lived if they work at all. And so what we'd like to know is what determines what's going to make a good microbial community versus a bad one. And there's maybe trillions of possibilities. I can't just build them all and test them all. It would take too many resources. Mm -hmm. And so what I'd like to do is to integrate AI into this process, design a small number of communities, run some experiments on it, take that data and narrow down somehow the space of the hypotheses I have about what makes a, a good microbial community versus a bad one, and use that model and any kind of uncertainties associated with that model to help design my next set of experiments or which microbial communities I wanted to um, test next. Hmm. And the hope is that by using AI in this process, we'll be able to use our money and, and experimental resources much more effectively than if we didn't have AI helping to suggest the new next new experiments to run. But if we become too reliant, is there a concern about a future where our research agendas are becoming driven by AI? Could AI actually lead to a decrease in creative ideas from the scientific community through path dependency based on the inputs we put into the system? It, it depends on the context. So if we go back to my earlier example, where I want to find the best microbial community out of trillions of possibilities, and I have a very clear notion of what makes it the best, I can measure that. I have a lot to gain here. I can reduce the amount of resources I have to spend on collecting data. But that approach is not appropriate if I'm really sort of more in an exploratory mode. Hmm. Right. So if I don't know exactly what I'm looking for, then using one of these methods might mean that I just never do an experiment on something that's that's really interesting, but just not exactly aligned with my overall objective. And so there's this kind of inherent trade off between exploration and, and exploitation. How do you mean by that? You know, part of good science is just sort of exploring the unknown. Part of what we try to do to make you know, products and services available to people is, is exploitation, trying to exploit our known knowledge uh, to, to design better systems or to, to guide the way we design experiments. Okay. And so depending on the context, yeah, I think um, using AI for experimental design would not be the right choice. And relying overly on an AI system to make predictions without kind of a thoughtful human behind the scenes is, is possibly a fool's errand. And of course, as our AI co-host mentioned at the beginning, who that human is behind the scenes matters a great deal. How AI could open the ability to do science up to more people and why that may not be a good thing after the break. If you're getting a lot out of the important research shared on Big Brains, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show you should check out. It's called Entitled, and it's about human rights. Co-hosted by lawyers and New Chicago Law School professors Claudia Flores and Tom Ginsburg, Entitled explores the stories around why rights matter and what's the matter with rights. Big Brains is supported by the University of Chicago Graham School. Are you a lifelong learner with an insatiable curiosity? Join us at Graham and access more than 50 open enrollment courses every quarter in literature, history, religion, science, and more. We open the doors of UChicago to learners everywhere. Expand your mind and advance your leadership. Online and in-person offerings are available. Learn more at graham.uchicago.edu slash bigbrains. There is this concern that AI will eliminate jobs, but could it be the other way around? There have always been strong barriers to doing science, like needing a deep knowledge of fields, methods, and statistics, and let's be honest, a high level of intelligence. 
But could these tools open the gates wider to people who may know how to ask the right questions and explore ideas, but don't have the other skills or time or money to acquire those skills? I'm not sure about the answer. Like, I I think there's inherent value to rigorous scientific training. So as we said before, you know, what ChatGPT is doing is it's generating plausible strings of text that might in no way be true. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for somebody to be able to, you know, recognize when this string of words is at all consistent with our understanding of science or where it might be going awry. And with no background, I think you're just unequipped to do that. On the other hand, you know, creativity is extremely important in science. We normally associate it more with the arts and humanities, but but really thinking of, you know, creative explanations for how the world works and why is, is essential. And so to some extent, if these tools allow people to generate more creative ideas, if we can develop AI assistance for scientists that allow them to to really harness their creativity, I think it could be be exciting. And there's a lot of people who are really thinking about leveraging or or developing creative AI assistance. You know, another way in which AI might help democratize science is in helping us to um, process our training data. So for instance, one big citizen science initiative that's been running for many years now is called Galaxy Zoo where humans do a little bit of training and then they're presented with images of galaxies and they're asked to answer some questions about those galaxies. And what this is doing is basically producing labels for the training data that might be used to analyze, you know, just millions of images of galaxies. And I think that, you know, having high quality uh, training data is essential to making a lot of these AI systems work well. And so this really, these kinds of citizen science projects provide a really cool opportunity, I think, for science enthusiasts to to play an important role. You know, I think there are also, you know, kind of a broader category of, of risks that we need to think about. For instance, if we place too much trust in these AI systems, we might think, well, we need to train fewer scientists in the United States hmm. because the AI is going to do all this work for us. And I think if we overestimate the capability of those systems, that's a real risk and and a real missed opportunity. We still need those those human thinkers. But what if those human thinkers are bad actors? We know that news organizations and people on social media will often cite case studies they've seen online, but have done very little research into. In a future where AI can generate a thousand fake studies that look legitimate in a matter of minutes, How should the scientific community be thinking about maintaining integrity? So if you were going to build safeguards in to to help advise on protecting against some of these downsides, what kind of safeguards would come top of mind to you? Yeah, it's a good question. So first, I'll just tell you some of the things that the people might have read about already in the news. Okay. So they'll say something like, well, I want to know what data that system was trained on. And on one hand, that sounds good. Like, I want to know if your face recognition was only trained on white men and will probably fail on black women. That seems like a useful thing for me to know. On the other hand, when we look at something like chat GPT that was trained on trillions of words that no human could possibly read, where no human could possibly read all of them, it's, it's kind of vacuous, right? Telling me that doesn't tell me anything informative about what's going on under the hood for that chat GPT system. Hmm. Another thing people have called for is building transparent or explainable AI systems where the AI system can explain the decision it's making to a layperson. And again, this sounds good in certain contexts. Like if we're using AI to decide who's going to be let out on bail before defending their case in court, It sounds good for us to be able to explain what criteria the AI system is using. Right, right. On the other hand, you know, there are other tasks that are very difficult to explain, especially to to a layperson. Like, how is a CAT scan image constructed from the raw data off the scanner? So, 
you know, there are a variety of things like this that have been proposed that in the right context are important and meaningful and in general are really insufficient. And I, I, I hate to say this because I don't have a better solution that I can propose. I think that that these are actually open technical questions. You know, how do we build a system that's going to allow us to somehow certify it, certify that it's not too biased against vulnerable groups, certify that it's protecting people's privacy in very general ways, certify that, you know, your autonomous vehicle is not going to kill a bicyclist besides just like designing tests and trying things out. Um, we don't really have a good handle on this. And it's, it's an open question about whether we can actually build in hooks or inroads into these systems that will allow us to, to test and validate and certify these systems more, more effectively. Another risk, science misinformation, if you will. Uh, so you could imagine someone maliciously trying to generate a bunch of fake scientific articles towards some end, presumably malicious, and making it very hard for earnest scientists to figure out well, what is actually known, what experiments were actually run, and what's been faked. Hmm. And that's going to just put a drain on the resources for this whole scientific community. And so, yeah, I think there are definitely uh, several different risks, some of them, you know, just in terms of what we need to do as, as academics to make sure that people are using AI in a rigorous and ethical way, and others about outside actors potentially doing, you know, malicious things that would have a terrible effect on us all. Right now, you know, human oversight is just essential. Here at the University of Chicago, like most U.S. universities, we have IRBs, Institutional Review Boards. And before I run certain experiments, I need their approval to make sure that there's no major ethical lapse. Now, for the most part, those boards are for when I'm running experiments on, on humans or, or animals. A lot of the research that I do on, on AI is not covered by those sorts of, of human oversight boards. So yeah, there, there certainly are risks. Uh, here at the University of Chicago, um, I'm, I'm seeing your name popping up with great frequency, all sorts of different topics with AI in the sciences. I mean, one of the great things about UChicago is that there's a huge number of interactions across different departments. And so, you know, physicists and chemists, astronomers, ecologists, computer scientists and statisticians are constantly getting together and talking with each other and partnering to help advance using AI uh, in a rigorous way in the sciences. Huh. And I think this is especially exciting because it's not like things are somehow pigeonholed where one little group is thinking about AI and physics and a totally separate group um, is thinking about AI and chemistry with no meeting in between. We've really been, been focused on trying to think about core principles in AI that will influence many of the sciences. And we're already seeing connections across different disciplines. Can you give any examples of, of some of those? The Margo and Tom Pritzker Foundation recently supported a joint conference between the University of Chicago and Caltech, bringing in worldwide experts in AI and science across multiple different disciplines for a, a three-day conference. And this was really an experiment. Most of the conferences in this space are, are much more kind of narrowly focused on a particular scientific domain. But it turned out to be great. We had um, a UChicago researcher, Samantha Reisenfeld, talking about how she uses clustering to understand aspects of immune responses and tissues. The idea is I've got a lot of, of different uh, data points. So for example, I've just got lots of different images of dogs, for instance. And these data points or these dog images, they don't have any labels. And what I want to do is I want to just group them into groups that somehow, where somehow everything in the group is similar and different groups are, or members of different groups are dissimilar. Fascinating. And so she was using these kinds of clustering ideas to 
analyze data from uh, human tissues and understanding people's immune responses to different pathogens. And there was a physicist from MIT who was listening to this talk and he said, this is amazing because it turns out I'm studying particle physics and I'm facing exactly the same challenge, but in a totally different context. And some of the specific approaches that Samantha was using turned out to be extremely relevant to the constraints associated with his physics problem. My goodness. Um, and people were thrilled by this. They said, yeah, normally I just talk to the same group of people over and over and see the same ideas in our small little insular community. And by having this conference across different boundaries, I saw a whole different set of methods I could use. As we step into our AI future, it can sometimes feel like we're in the famous dinner scene from Jurassic Park. The world has just changed so radically and we're all running to catch up. It's clear that AI could be a powerful tool that scientists could use to cure diseases, solve climate change, or even take us to outer space. But... Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. As Professor Willett explains, there are all sorts of ways these systems could go wrong. Radically wrong. If they get too far ahead of human oversight, judgment, and control. And even ChatGPT agrees. AI can be a powerful tool. It doesn't replace the need for human judgment. AI is best used in partnership with human researchers, rather than as a replacement for them. Big Brains is a production of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating and a review. The show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by me, Matt Hodap, and Leah Cesarine. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.